Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, The State of Observability and Log Management in 2022. We're currently in the midst of a perfect storm of massive data growth and a need for innovation. In order to shed light on key trends, observability challenges, and some of the approaches to resolving those observability challenges, we went ahead and surveyed over 315 IT professionals across a variety of industries. In this survey, we got their perspectives on the current state of exploding data and their struggle to gather valuable insights from that data. Our goal in running the survey was one, to understand what's driving the massive growth of, of observability data, and two, what approaches will help teams be more productive. Today, we're excited to share the results of the survey and some of the data points that help us answer those questions. I'm Richard Gibson. I work on the marketing team here at Aira Software. There's a few items I'd like to address before we dive in. First, we'll be sharing the full presentation after the webinar, so no need to worry about taking notes or screenshots. Second, there'll be some attachments you can open and download during our presentation. And finally, if there's any questions that come to mind during the presentation, go ahead and submit them, and we'll save some time at the end to answer those questions. Before we get into the webinar, I'd like to introduce you to our two speakers. First up, we have Todd Person, who is the co-founder and CEO of Era Software. And presenting with him is Stella Udovicic, who is the Senior Vice President of Marketing at Era Software. Stella, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. Um, it is my pleasure to share uh, very exclusive findings from our first ever State of Observability and Log Management uh, report with you. As Richard mentioned, here are some of our goals. Uh, the primary research goal was to capture very hard data on trends, observability and log management trends and understand um, what's happening uh, in the market going forward in 2022 and beyond. We ran this survey in February 2022, and um, as, as Richard mentioned, we surveyed uh, more than 300 professionals, both executives and individual contributors. And all professionals had responsibility for managing availability uh, and cloud environments, application and infrastructures. So here's some of our demographics. Um, we divided uh, demographics in this volume of data and industry. We gather data from across the spectrum on the industries from fintech, uh, technology, transportation, energy, etc. And also we targeted customers, enterprises, and organizations that have at least 10 terabytes of log data to manage. And when it comes to different role levels, uh, we had uh, almost a third of distribution of IT executives, a third of DevOps and SRE practitioners, and also uh, cloud and uh, application and enterprise architects consisted for about 34%. Regionally, this survey focused on North America with about 75% of people coming from United States and Canada, uh, some in Europe, about fifth, um, and a little bit in Asia Pacific. So there are three big uh, groups of trends uh, that emerged when we ran our survey. The first group is, is that overall, there's a huge volume in growth in observability data. So the first question that we have asked is, how does your IT organization deal with all that uh, data? Majority of users, and what are the uses uh, that organization have? And majority of users are in troubleshooting and monitoring the performance of applications and infrastructures, improving security, and also supporting uh, IT audits. There is one very interesting finding uh, that we have captured, and it's also that log data is still very heavily used for understanding not only user experience, but both user and product experience. And that's, uh, that's very, very interesting, despite some of the, like over the years, um, investments made in more specialized tooling, such as application performance monitoring. And one of the reasons that could be the case is because APM tools are seen as very, very expensive. So people still resort to uh, use logs uh, to understand uh, user experience. So we expected that IT has variety of users from log data, but we were also pleasantly surprised to see that insights from understanding, from analyzing log data is seen across the organizations and also um, within, the, uh, within the business and lines of business stakeholders for a variety of use cases. One is understanding customer activities, um, compliance reporting is big, and also, as I mentioned, improving product and user experience. Um, one anecdotal finding is that um, 
less than 1% also commented that they use EE sites to predict failures. So that's in interesting to find. Well, I kind of expected to see more of uh, using, uh, using logs and applying AI and ML techniques on top to predict failures. And this is certainly something that we'll expect to see in the future due to massive amount of log data, we're going to see more application of machine learning and uh, AI technologies on log data to make um, these insights available uh, for all in an accessible manner. And um, in this next uh, finding, there's almost unanimous consensus that um, from our survey responded that all uh, log data is important uh, for IT outcomes, as well as vast majority of our respondents said that log data is also essential for business outcomes. And uh, about 70% state that it's critical and very, very important. And the larger the organization, the that and that has more log data to manage, they're seeing they're seeing IT uh, the, the they're seeing that IT outcomes is even more important um, in those larger organizations with with lots of data to manage, and the, one of the reason is that when an organization thinks that that they will get useful information or critical insights from log data, then they will uh, work to harness uh, that information uh, from log data and they have uh, volumes of log data. So still very, very interesting uh, finding. And there's also universal agreement across all that overall in the coming years, we'll see that uh, data, that log data volumes will just uh, keep uh, continuing to grow. So what are some of the data sources that are driving that growth? Uh, within top three data sources are infrastructure, security, and cloud services logs. And that's very closely followed by application development, containerized environments. And as a standalone sources, um, we're seeing content delivery network accounts for 22% of um, growth of log data that people selected as a, as a major source, um, such as Cloudflare. And I find that's really, really uh, interesting. So. Tell what, what do you think about uh, content delivery networks um, as a major source for log data harvesting? Yeah, I think one of the things that we've seen is that, you know, I, I think you highlighted the places that um, people tend to use log, log management heavily for infrastructure security and, and cloud services. Um, those are seen as, as, as more critical logs. And I think as we look at part of the, the volume explosion, it seems like, um, teams have to make decisions about which which logs are the most valuable. So I think CDNs are kind of lower on the percentage spectrum, primarily because they they tend to be the, one of the first ones to get tossed to the side. So I think we've, we've actually seen a lot of interest, um, you know, especially with services like Cloudflare, where you can actually get um, use their log push service to receive those CDN logs. I think as we as we see more affordable and more efficient ways to manage logs at scale, I think we're starting to see CDNs as one of those um, easy wins for some of these teams to be able to get back um, insights um, in, into what's coming into their network. And I think in particular, as we start to look at the rise of, um, you know, the importance of cybersecurity, we're seeing CDN as kind of a, of a leading edge for being able to assess, assess threats, you know, look for un, unwanted behavior before it comes into the applications. So I think, you know, wh while it may be a, a lower percentage on this graph, I think it's a place where we see a lot of, a lot of room for growth in the future. Thank you very much, uh, Todd. Now, moving on to the next question and the set of finding is that IT executives and enterprise architects uh, report um, the most types of log data growth when compared to DevOps, SREs, and operational operations uh, professional. And one thing, it could be that they, because of their position in the organization, but also, um, interestingly, is that if you look at um, security data um, growth here, there is a discrepancy between executives and the rest of the roles we polled. So as executives consider that uh, security um, source as a source for data growth is going to be for 78%, while the rest is uh, kind of at least 
like almost 10, 10 percentages lower. And it could be that IT executives also need to keep a close track of that uh, data growth so they can manage. And then security is seen as a big uh, source for data growth uh, for them. So it's interesting finding when you analyze different, uh, the analyze differences in responses between different roles. Now, when it comes to how much log data is expected to grow, there is not a consensus whether it's going to be 25% and everybody said that, but also there is something that is going to be two to five times um, growth, for instance, 20% of people, something that there's 50% of uh, growth, but still um, the overall trend is that data will continue to grow and as you compound that uh, that information across several five years, this is just in 2022, we are seeing kind of a sky, sky, skyrocketing trend in overall um, growth of this uh, data source, data type. So even as log data is growing, it seems that not everyone is happy about that growth. And in fact, majorities see that while it is very necessary for the log data to grow, they have a very mixed feelings about uh, this growth because log data is seen as kind of massive and come in variety of formats. So uh, it's not easy uh, to reap the, the or glean insights uh, from massive amount of data, at least not with existing uh, methods. So before I dive into the next uh, group of research findings, so what do we think about this kind of set of findings um, that I summarized in the, in the first part? I think I think that the thing that's most interesting is that there's there's basically a you know everybody assumes that that these data volumes are going to keep growing. Um, we're seeing it come from a lot of different places, and I think the really the only question is you know depending on uh, each each individual respondent's sort of perspective, like do they think it's going to grow you know uh, like a, a medium amount or a huge amount? Um, and so I think you know really we're just seeing I think we're seeing kind of the the result of a lot of, you know, pushes towards uh, moving things to the cloud, uh, scaling up infrastructure. I mean, I think a lot of this even started with kind of the rise of containers, you know, five to seven years ago, we're just seeing a lot more, a lot more systems, a lot more microservices and a lot more infrastructure. Um, and as a result, you know, monitoring these systems, keeping them healthy, I think is just, it's starting to show us that um, the data volume required to really manage these systems well um, is going to be pretty massive. And I think, um, you know, with the, the pie chart you showed about uh, people's feelings about the log growth, um, I think we're, we're starting to really see that practitioners are struggling to figure out how to make use of all this data that they're generating. Um, and so I think it's, I think it's going to be a, a continued challenge as these volumes just continue to grow year over year if, if, uh, if the tooling doesn't change. Uh, thank you. That seems like a perfect segue into our next um, set of findings. And then as Richard highlighted, it's kind of a perfect storm of changes in the application architectures and more massive adoption of, of cloud. So, um, so let's see how IT practitioners and IT executives deal with um, all that data growth. So 76% uh, of uh, survey um, responses found that um, enterprises do take steps to minimize the overall log data um, volume and log data growth. And the biggest uh, one is that they just store the critics. The first group is 62% said they just store the only critical data. And some of them decide to quickly erase data within 24 hours. And What's really amazing to me to, is to see that almost 20%, 18% of IT teams we pulled choose to disable logging, which could be quite dangerous, right? You know, incidents may happen right at that time and you, you're choosing essentially to fly uh, blind. Another answer which uh, we found is an an anecdotal but frequent response is that, um, Enterprises do erase at some point, but do they keep log data for a longer time as the log data is needed for compliance, for audits, uh, and for forensics analysis. So delete log data, but uh, after, after its um, usefulness is, is, is still you know, needed for, for troubleshooting and all this analysis that they just mentioned. 
And um, it's into also interesting that IT executives are uh, far less likely to report all the efforts to minimize uh, log data volumes. And one thing, it could be either like those efforts really don't uh, reach um, them, or it's um, it's something that uh, they're, they're, they're not reporting on, but it's something that essentially one needs to uh, keep tabs on because um, of all the data pr proliferation also incurs uh, rising uh, costs. So, and then when it comes to those costs, almost 80% state that they are trying to minimize costs because uh, there's various methods that they're trying to minimize costs. One can use like a offline storage method like S3 or uh, one approach is that to try to reduce licensing at least costs for commercial vendors is to use open source tools. And some of the danger is that like there's still costs associated, but it just may not be tracked in a in more traditional way. There's still uh, infrastructure costs that need to be taken into uh, advantage. But it's interesting to see that there's a huge group of people, about 40%, that chooses to route data to less expensive at all. So there's a lot of effort invested into uh, figuring out um, costs and not just simply managing uh, volumes. And um, there are also mixed results um, when it comes to the success of these efforts. So um, some of the survey respondents said that they wish they had data they erased, uh, or it's very difficult to access data once you store it to some uh, offline method like uh, cold storage. And only 12% uh, think that all these efforts uh, they're, they're making to reduce the, the volumes and costs are effective. Um, what do you think, Todd, about this kind of success of existing efforts or moving data to um, things such as S3, for instance? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the the use of of S3 or GCS, just you know, object storage in general, is it's interesting. I mean, it I think it kind of indicates that those logs have some value, and while there may be um, some artificial limits for storing in the in primary log management systems, whether it's you know. Uh, a cost or just hardware limits. They, they can't store it all in the systems that they, they want to. Um, they don't want to get rid of them. They don't want to lose them forever. So they sort of put them in uh, a, a holding place. You know, it's, it's sort of like um, it, you know, basically like a, a, a data lake, like a low quality data lake. You can just send archives, archives of logs there. Um, but, you know, it means that there's probably a desire for those logs to be useful at some point in the future. But the, the, really, the, tr the trouble comes in when you're trying to balance uh, the, the growing data volumes we were talking about earlier with the, uh, the kind of fixed costs of um, existing systems. And those those costs generally aren't going down, but the data volumes are going up. So at a certain point, um, you kind of hit that decision point where you have to figure out what to do. Um, and I think, again, it just it comes back to kind of what we were saying at the beginning of this section, which is it, it feels like there's a need for new tools that can kind of change that cost value paradigm a bit because we're 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 seeing that folks are trying a bunch of strategies to reduce costs, um, but ultimately it feels like they're they're having to take a path that really minimizes the value that they can get from logs because things become considerably less search searchable when they're just uh, you know a static archive um, left on object storage. Yeah, lots of uh, lots of more and lots of fascinating uh, findings here, um, which brings us to the next next set of questions. Next question is. We wanted to understand um, what are some of the challenges in dealing uh, with log data and um, our survey respondents identify all those challenges and they chosen what are some of the steps they find uh, really hard to do. And it turns out that um, pre preparing, filtering and cleaning data is seen as a so hardest step, which is also storing data uh, followed by the uh, storing data in the cost efficient uh, way. Um, and also another um, another response that we captured that is not um, in in this chart is that uh, people find the event uh, correlation not easy, which also underlines uh, the fact that you just cannot dump data to things such as S3, but you have to have the data accessible and easy uh, to consume and correlate, and then figure out uh, insights and queries that we need to run on those. Uh, on, on those um, data. Um, and then moving to the next one, 97% of IT practitioners report that 
existing tools um, have um, challenges in particular because they're not built to handle this huge, massive amount of log data. And um, there are a variety of things that uh, those challenges are. The first one is it just takes too much time to uh, analyze data that are coming from a variety of different tools, like kind of traditional tool proliferation is still not solved. Um, then, you know, you see the, the, the resources uh, that are dedicated to manage all these tools, the, the larger organization, the more resources they need to manage these tools. And then um, some of the also very um, answers that are captured is that different departments have different needs and want different tools. So when that's the case, how do you see the complete picture across all the departments? And there's no, um, there's lack of logging standards, um, which also makes ingestion pretty hard, which goes in alignment with the point what we just made earlier that preparing, filtering and making data easy for ingestion is, is not, e not seen as easy. And also um, another one is there's no central place to capture all the all those data. So there's lots of um, challenges, um, also scaling a uh, price uh, with uh, the scaling of data volumes is also seen as uh, another challenge. And um, this is where kind of scalability of tools comes into picture so that um, we, we ask teams to evaluate the risks uh, they face when you, you grow your data volumes, but your tools may not scale with the amount of data that's coming at you, as Todd mentioned earlier, uh, from this kind of adoption of different application architecture, there's like all different like uh, sources of data that you need to handle that you didn't think about, which also can have um, impacts, such as one obvious one is troubleshooting, but a troubleshooting and kind of long time it takes for incidents to resolve because you need to deal with uh, uh, all these data sources. So troubleshooting takes longer. But also one interesting um, response that we got is that insecurity risks are larger and people complain that they can expose and accidentally log uh, per PII data as well as credentials. Which, which kind of brings again into the, the mix that especially for security, scaling all the data and making sure the tool support the massive data growth is essential because your security risks are going to be higher if you don't think about um, uh, the massive data growth. So the other, uh, the other risks are um, applications become less reliable, um, you may lose some monitoring data, and then ultimately all that uh, could lead to loss of customers and, uh, and direct revenue impacts. And when it comes to executives, um, it's also interesting that uh, executives, IT executives are more aware um, than you would potentially expect of resolution times and loss of revenue impact um, when uh, compared to the uh, operations um, or IT practitioners. And it's very always interesting to see what is those discrepancy between uh, different roles. And, um, you know, it's in the second one, incidents take a longer time to resolve. That seems to be a top of mind uh, for executives because that ultimately impacts uh, customers. Um, and then I'll turn to Todd to share uh, our, our third group of uh, findings here. Um, so I think really just looking at um, the, I, I think basically what we're seeing here, and I'm, I'm trying to think about how to recap everything that we've already said, is that, you know, we see that the amount of data that people are handling that are going to have to manage going forward is going to grow. The costs are rising, and we're seeing a lot of the, the tooling choices that I think folks have made um, are, are directly impacting uh, how much they're spending just managing these log volumes. And so essentially um, what I think we're, we're proposing, I think what we're advocating for here is that we, we see that there's a, a necessary change that's coming in the log management space that I think is going to need to happen in order for these log volumes to be able to be handled um, with the, you know, we, at, at one end we were talking about 10 to 50% uh, year over year growth um, and as high as, you know, 5x year over year growth. Um, and so I think in order for companies to be able to really get value out of the logs that they're creating, the logs that we've 
you know, kind of already articulated, um, they, we know there's value in them. Um, the, the tooling really needs to evolve to get to a point where not only are the costs manageable, but are the insights that people want to get out of those logs manageable to make it, you know, worth, worth collecting and keeping that data um, so that, that, you know, the entire business can get use out of it. And I think Stella, one thing you were, you were saying on the, the slide about the, the awareness, you know, it's, it's not, it's not too surprising to me that you see the, the IT executives are the ones that are like most concerned about revenue, loss of revenue. They're most concerned about MTTR and whether it's, you know, reality that it takes a long time to them. I think when they're looking at business impacts, it feels like a long time. And so I think the more, uh, the, the harder it's, it gets as the data volumes grow to get insights, the more value there's going to be further and further up the business to have tooling that really gets you to, um, you know, ingesting the data volumes that, that need to be ingested and getting insights um, regardless of how that continues to scale year over year. Um, and then I think the, the other thing that um, is, is really interesting is that, you know, observability has been around, I mean, as a term, let's say less than a decade, maybe seven, seven years or so. Um, I think the thing that we're seeing is that there's still a lot of folks that are uh, early in their, in their observability journey. So I think looking at this slide, you know, only 11% feel like they have uh, a mature observability implementation. And I think, you know, it, it really just says that there are a lot of tools out there, but there are still a lot of people who are evaluating um, and adopting tools, but really figuring out how that works into a full, full blown organization wide strategy. And so I think if you look at the folks that are, you know, to the right on this graph that have either uh, never really embraced observability or heard of it, or, you know, just haven't picked any tooling yet. Um, there, there's still a pretty big subset of folks out there who are early in that journey, I think are really trying to figure out what this means for their business at large. And so I think what we'll see is as these, as these folks continue to move to the left, you know, there's going to be a lot more opportunities to bring new companies into the observability space. But I think also we're going to just continue to see um, those folks who are new to the journey be surprised by the amount of data that they're generating, whether it's, you know, logs, metrics, or traces. Um, and so I think it's, you know, while it feels like a relatively um, widespread concept, I think this data is telling us that there's still a lot, um, a lot yet to, to go before we reach maturity in the observability space. And I did a similar survey um, last year, and it's very interesting, even though it's still early, that compared to 2021, we see the overall growth of observability data adoption is really staggering 180%. So it's, it's growing, um, but we still have uh, room to grow of overall observability. And uh, Todd, uh, moving on to a little bit, kind of if you can walk us through some of the next findings and the, um, kind of the types of data and what are the different um, varieties and et cetera. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think the, you know, as we, as we talk about observability, we think about kind of, there are three, you know, traditional pillars, logs, metrics, and, and traces. Um, and so, you know, logs have probably been around for the longest or the most ubiquitous, like they were, they were kind of the original form of getting data out of, out of these systems. Um, and so it, it's kind of not surprising that uh, logs are the most data, but also, you know, as data volumes continue to grow, logging is really the easiest, um, easiest to add, easiest for application developers. And I think the other thing to keep in mind is that the way that most of these metrics are generated, logs are generally generated, you know, um, per request, you know, like the, the more users interact with systems, the more logs are generated, you know, in, in direct correlation. And there are logs from other things as well, but I think metrics generally tend to have a relatively uh, stable output cadence. So if you look at, you know, kind of Prometheus standard, it's, you know, data gets reported once every 10 seconds or every 30 seconds, depending on how you, how you have it configured. So those generally are decoupled from, you know, growing user volumes. Um, so I think we'll, we'll continue to see log data be, be the driver, I think, in terms of, of most data. And also if we're looking at it in terms of just, you know, um, you know, gigabytes of, of whichever data format, um, logs also continue to get uh, more and more verbose. We can keep adding more tags and more fields and more descriptive um, modifiers. And I think logs see that a lot more than I think the other other data formats. Um, you know, 
and then coming back to the data variety, you know, we mentioned earlier, like it can be um, cloud cloud native deployments, it can be Kubernetes infrastructure, it can be CDN, it can be application logs. There are all these different places where logs come from. Um, and I think sort of by almost by design, you know, logs have that flexibility to really be able to just be inserted anywhere. Um, metrics continue to be relatively well structured and the places that metrics are exposed are, are also well structured. So I think we're gonna, we'll just see, you know, logs come from a, a wide variety of sources, contain a wide variety of, of information within them and, you know, continue to be, um, you know, for better or worse, less less structured than the other other types of metrics. Um, and then when it comes down to cost, you know, I, th I think these other two, uh, you know, drivers really lead to cost, having more data, having more variety, you know, obviously the higher data volumes is just expensive because it's more data. Um, but I think logs, because they are so, they have so much variety, they're harder to index on, they're harder to scale, they're harder to get value out of, the queries end up being more complex. Um, and so I think kind of all, all three of these, these pieces here really feed in together to just say, you know, logs are a place where I think companies um, are going to continue to invest heavily. I think they're going to continue to expect uh, that there's a lot of rich data in those logs. Um, and I, I don't see that trend changing anytime soon. If, if anything, I think in some of these, we might see um, you know, logs continue to, to grow more potentially. That, that's uh, that's something that uh, on this graph also is that you know the cost related to um, managing tracing is also very interesting. Um, just by the sheer amount of traces, it could be billions of traces recorded. So it seems also that sampling needs to further grow to get you know get the cost down because it's 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 a it's disproportional amount of costs that's associated with tracing as well compared to the other methods it's kind of very fascinating yep, but, definitely i think that's a great observation um todd moving to the wide variety of tools to manage yeah, and, yeah i think we you know we talked a little bit about some of these the offline cold storage options um and i i think those make sense you know i mean in terms of um you know, cost per unit of storage, it's, it's hard to get much cheaper than, um, than S3, you know, for the, especially for the durability that you get. Um, but I think what we're seeing here is that as these data volumes grow that we're talking about, you know, we see companies that have been traditionally heavy users of, of tools like Splunk um, start to look for more affordable options for, for some of these bigger data volumes, potentially uh, data that's less mission critical. Um, and so we see the adoption of open source tools. I think Elasticsearch is very common in this space. Um, and we see the, you know, kind of that stratification of costs and we see it sort of get pushed down to lower tiers. But the thing that I think uh, companies are starting to realize also is that even as, as those tools are embraced and start to grow, now someone has to maintain those and someone has to manage a new piece of infrastructure, which has its own cost, it has its own operational overhead. So there's sort of the, you know, cloud-based Blog management uh, products that are that are in the mix, and there obviously are a bunch of folks out there. Um, and I think what we're seeing also is that those costs have continued to grow because as as these um, you know largely SaaS players, I think in the log management space, see their their data volumes grow. Um, you know that cost gets passed on to customers, and so I think whether it's you know using traditional log management products or kind of doing it in a DIY manner and hosting your own Elasticsearch. Uh, cluster or pushing those costs to the cloud. I think what we're seeing is that it, it, it's becoming a big expense. And I think with the data volumes that I think a lot of companies are starting to approach now, it's becoming, I think, very difficult to to fit into the traditional, I think, budgets that I think people have, have planned for, for observability. And so I think really what we're, what we're, you know, looking at, I think, is the big sea change that's coming is finding a way to straddle some of those traditional costs, whether it's, you know, on-prem or in the cloud, um, versus the, the the low cost of object storage and finding a, a middle ground where you can leverage some of those cost savings, but still get the um, you know the queryability and data insights that you want from that log data, um, while while finding ways to over time kind of bring those costs down. Um, and I think this this slide also is is interesting, um, just kind of looking at how many um, how many companies actually have 
uh, a team that can manage some of these these tools. And so, you know, 30%, 37% say that they don't have any dedicated resources. So it almost is a, a given that they're going to have to use a cloud service or something that that's managed by another vendor. Um, but 20% have a, have a dedicated team, like a full team to manage mm -hmm. their log tooling. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, whether it's that 19% or the other 44% that say they have some some individuals that are responsible, you know, there, there's a significant investment there because generally these are going to be, you know, technical employees, they're going to be, you know, relatively uh, advanced with the, the ability to manage these tools. Um, you know, there's a significant cost there that goes above and beyond any software licenses or any hardware that you're having to pay for to manage these platforms. Um, and my guess is that if we took data, took the same data from a year ago, these numbers would have expanded, that we would see um, more dedicated teams, more dedicated individuals spending their time on this. Um, and I think really just, uh, you know, whether it's logs, metrics, or traces, I think a lot, it's been, the value is, is increasing to companies, uh, but also so is the investment um, in keeping these systems running. And, you know, the, I don't know, unsurprising part of it is the more these are used, the more they become um, part of the critical path for um, uptime incident resolution. And so it's it's not acceptable for those systems to, to be down or to fail. So having those folks in charge of keeping those systems up and running, you know, is, it becomes a critical business function. Um, and I think this is just showing us that uh, the bigger the company, the more data, the more likely they are to have um, a dedicated team, you know, or a dedicated set of individuals that are managing this. And this comes back to, I think, kind of what we were saying about, um, you know, uh, business outages and, and loss of revenue. I think as these systems become more com more critical, more complex, uh, and more a focus of, you know, how um, really how, how outages affect the business, you know, we see more and more resources from a human capital perspective and also from a, you know, just infrastructure and uh, hardware expenditure on on managing this data and, and getting value out of it. So um, yeah, I think with all the things that kind of led up to this, this slide uh, isn't super surprising to me. Um, it probably isn't to most people. And then I think one other thing that we've been um, starting to see a little bit, and, and I guess this feeds, feeds a bit into sort of the overall narrative here about um, growth of observability data, um, how this gets managed in, in larger companies, um, by looking at you know stream processing or or, or streaming observability data, um, we're we're starting to see some of the early phases of this, um, and I think this this is kind of lagging the overall observability market a bit because it's it's becoming um, more important, more valuable. I think as these uh, data volumes have have been growing, and so I think probably going back a bit. A lot of the uh, a lot of existing observability pipeline work is probably built around something like Kafka or RabbitMQ or some of the other kind of existing open source, just general general purpose message queues. Uh, but I think what we're starting to see is that uh, other solutions are emerging that um, give you the ability to have something that's more specifically focused on observability data and primarily recognizing that that data is it's time series data. Um, there are certain things you want to be able to do with logs or with metrics, whether it's from, uh, you know, the systems that you support and route data to and from, the ways that you want to, um, you know, clean that data up, the way that you want to be able to potentially look for or redact PII. Um, I think a lot of that data becomes very um, specific in the way that it needs to be handled. And so I think this is really showing, you kind of can see almost like two, two cohorts in here. And the first is folks that have some sort of a, of a tool or in the process of picking a tool. Um, and my guess is that most of the folks that say they have a fully deployed solution are probably running Kafka or something like it under the hood. Mm -hmm. There's some newer vendors in this space that we see some adoption for. But then, you know, you do see almost a quarter of respondents are evaluating options and then another 14% are considering evaluating options. So there, there's sort of becoming this set of problems that I think observability pipelines are made to handle that are becoming more important to, to companies. And I think a lot of this kind of the subtext, I think, is that a lot of this comes back to the things we talked about previously, which are um, managing the complexity of the data, managing the cost of the data, figuring out how to optimize your um, you know, your infrastructure resources to get the most value out of this data. And so I think it's, it's still very early, um, but I think observability pipelines are going to be a thing that make 
more and more appearances in the overall observability space and start to become that connective tissue between all these different tools that I think people are using. Um, and then again, this, this kind of breaks down, you know, by role, whether we're looking at IT executives, architects, or DevOps, um, where the observability pipeline kind of investment fits in. Um, unsurprisingly, you know, the architect role is, is largely, I think, pushing this as they're starting to think about, um, you know, all the different tools, all the different observability tools that they may be using, all the different data sources, um, where the data is coming from, and, and how they think about, um, you know, across a large organization, how do they manage that data? How are they thinking about the growth of that data and what they're going to need to have in place to make that something that's scalable down the road? And then, you know, I think this one's super fun. Um, everybody thinks there's value in uh, innovating for in observability. And, you know, whether it's in the, the what, what the tools are capable of or the type of data that can be supported, um, you know, I think it's it's recognized i think pretty broadly now that observability is is potentially a huge um could bring huge value to to organizations and i think you know as as the the prolif proliferation of tools continues uh, as the data volumes continue uh, i think it, it's becoming clear that there's no there's no perfect solution out there there's no there's really no single tool that i think does everything that teams want um and so i think really uh, what we'll continue to see over, I think, the next next few years is that we'll see probably more folks move towards. And Stella, I know this is your one of your favorite terms, the, the single pane of glass. Like, I think there there's a desire for more teams to be able to see more sort of cohesive views into this data. And it's not it's not a, a, a super easy thing to do because I think we're you know especially when we're talking about data in you know the petabyte scale. There, there's a lot there. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of different sources on a lot of different stakeholders. Um, but I think we'll, you know, we'll continue to see more and more, um, I think, interesting innovations in not only in just how we store this data at, at scale, um, but also how we um, just how we get value out of those tools and how we start to pass that value further, further up the chain within these organizations so that more, more people higher up can, can get value out of the, the insights that they're gathering from observability data. Um, and then, yeah, um, I think this goes back to another slide earlier that you had, Stella. But I think having um, having tools that I think do a good job of supporting this observability data growth um, gets people more excited about what's possible. I think a lot of what's happening um, for the teams that are not interested is um, it becomes so much about managing the infrastructure, managing the costs and the pain associated. And it becomes almost this um i don't know constant constant stress that you're trying to manage these things that you that are growing out of control and you can't actually get to a point where you can sit back and enjoy having having really good tools in front of you and so i think really this is just showing us the more mature the observability infrastructure is at an organization the the more exciting i think the insights are the more value they get from the data and the more um the more i think the organization feels like more data is better, and I think that's that's what we've we've all wanted to believe. Um, but I think we've been all we've been hindered a bit by by tooling in the observability space. And um, yeah, I think this is just some uh, some hope, hopefully for for those of you out there that have been struggling that um, modernizing your observability infrastructure can can be a good thing can can be achieved. Now moving on to more of a summary of our discussions, um, we. You know, there's some, there's lots of excitement out there, and to underline that still innovation is urgently needed. Todd, how do you see these percentages? It's very high percentages that um, are reporting um, some of the kind of big statements here. Yeah, definitely. I think I think this this fits into a bunch of the things we were already saying, but you know. Um, you know, just sticking your log data in S3, you know, you, you've achieved the goal of storing it, but you haven't achieved the goal of, of getting any business value out of it. And so I think really it's, it's um, you know, maybe the last slide was the, the perfect one to kind of fit into this. So, you know, 100% of people think that the, oh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, the, the previous, yeah, 100% of people think that there's, um, you know, value in innovating in observability. You know, it's not surprising that that we see these these high percentages. So yeah, we need to be able to find new ways of storing this data at scale that are that are queryable, that are actionable. Um, we want to be able to make the tools um, 
actually solve the problem rather than just becoming uh, a pain point for uh, for engineering teams. And you know, sometimes you just take the problem and you just push it onto you know, kind of those dedicated teams we were talking about before. Um, and then, yeah, and I think you know, innovation I think is going to be key here, uh, moving away from some traditional traditional tools. And I'll I'll throw I'll throw Elasticsearch out here. You know, it's it's been around for quite a while. It's it's a relatively mature tool. Um, it gets used a lot in, in log management use cases, but the the kind of my my summary of it is that it's it wasn't built for that. It happens to be a good fit for some of those use cases, um, but ultimately it tends to become uh, more and more painful and more and more expensive as the data volumes grow. And so I think we're seeing a lot of that right now um, starting to play out in the market. And so, um, yeah, it's it's comforting to me to see that everybody seems to agree that there's some innovation needed and in that um, I think there, there, there is a possibility to, I think, do better with observability um, through a lot of the, I think, the new products that are starting to come to market. Now that we covered quite a lot of research, um, we gleaned some new insights, some expected, some unexpected. Todd, could you share with us a little bit about what are some of the recommendations we can have for people out there um, in the space? Yeah, so I think um, some of these are going to be relatively straightforward, but I, I think you know as you start to look at your at your options at your at your existing. Um, Choices for observability. Um, there are, you know, products that are becoming available that are, you know, leveraging cloud native um, architectures that are, you know, sitting on top of things like S3 or, or GCS um, that are are finding a better way to um, sort of dynamically stratify these these log layers um, that I think people are, are starting are trying to figure out themselves. So I think really, you know, keep an eye out for, for tools, that I think, help with that cost management. Um, I think we'll start to see a lot more of those out there in the market. Um, and I think right now, a lot of the tools that folks are using, I would say, are, are relatively, um, I guess, are sitting on the kind of a previous generation of, of uh, technology. And so I think a lot of the costs that are out there in the market right now are, are artificially high. Um, you know, I think, and along with that, um, I think there's there's a desire to keep, especially with logs, not so much with metrics, um, a desire to keep data around for longer periods of time. So I think, um, you know, as we see desires grow to have, um, you know, audit and compliance ready uh, storage for logging, um, there's also the ability to be able to go back and run uh, potentially, you know, machine learning models on, on historical log data to get customer insights. Um, you know, I think starting to factor those those uh, storage terms into your plans and then figure out how you can how you can leverage your tools to be able to to make that storage work in a cost effective way is going to be important. Um, finding ways to expose some of this observability data to other parts of your organization. I think largely it's been um, mostly restricted to, to DevOps and SRE. But I think as we start to see, um, you know, more of these mature type of observability infrastructures we discussed, I think um, a big part of that is, is starting to surface that data, surface those insights, surface the, you know, the, the MTTRs, the, the incident responses to, to other stakeholders is important. Um, you know, I think paired up with the, the low cost um, and, and long-term storage, just finding, finding tools that give you the power to get uh, extract data from your, from your historical archives, whether it's being able to have it online and queryable, or it's uh, you know, being able to have a set of, of tools that can um, quickly look over some of that cold data without having to you know, delegate individual engineers to go pull that data down and, and, and look through it. Um, I think there are a bunch of different ways to go about, about getting there. Um, and then I think kind of onto the innovations in observability pipelines and observability data management, um, looking for tools that can help you with some pre-processing, some you know, overall reduction of data volumes. Um, I, think, I think that's going to be something, as I said, that is, um, is growing a lot and, and gets a lot of innovation going forward. And we'll start to see that appear in a lot more organizations. Um, and then, yeah, just integrating with with other existing tools, and and so I think a lot of this is um, as you look at potentially observability pipelines. You know, you don't necessarily have to replace your tools. Um, I think especially if you look at, at some of these tools that are deeply embedded in um, 
you know, security organizations or have, have business critical insights, um, you don't need to replace them. You can find tools that can be operated alongside them and you can use um, observability pipelines and things like that to figure out which data goes into which tool and how do you um, kind of shuffle that, that data in an automated way and make it possible to, you know, essentially let the tools rebalance that data for you so that you can, um, you know, more effectively optimize the costs of the tools that you're choosing to put data into and let the, the use cases or the needs from that data drive, um, you know, which, which tool and which cost profile is associated with that data. So I think kind of, you know, all of these things together, I think are things that we'll start to see uh, more and more as these log volumes continue to grow. Um, but I think the upside is that there are, there are ways and tools and strategies, I think, to get to a, a manageable um, profile. And I think, again, going back to one of the earlier slides, the more mature organizations that have gotten to a place where they've, they've figured these things out, um, they do actually start to get value out of that observability data and get excited about having more of it available. But I think a lot of it comes down to picking the right tools and strategies to, um, to make sure that your organization can be successful. Thank you very much, Todd. Now moving into the, the Q&A portion uh, of our presentation, uh, we covered quite a lot of insights. And if you'd like to get the full uh, report, um, here's the link. Uh, you can download it for free and read um, the details and keep it for you and kind of see if you, if you find this uh, summaries of this report, something that you've seen in real, um, in practice. So. Uh, over to Richard to see if there are any questions on the line. Yep, we do have a few questions. The first question is, based on findings, what do you see for observability going beyond 2022? This is for Todd. Yeah, happy happy to answer that one. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I think we we talked about it. Uh, in a bunch of different ways, but I, I think the biggest piece of it is that, you know, observability is here to stay. Um, I think we're, we're just going to continue to see data volumes grow. Um, and I think jump, jumping into a parallel space, you know, um, IoT data is another, it's another, you know, time series use case that's similar to observability. Um, you know, that that's also been continuing to grow and largely fueled by uh, the number of devices that are out there, the number of um, uh, data points that you want to be able to get insight on. And I think what we're really seeing is, is a lot of these parallel evolutions where, um, you know, the, the compute resources are becoming more ubiquitous, the number of, um, whether it's microservices or containers or individual processes that are being monitored. Um, you know, we're seeing that hardware become, hardware and sort of the, the low-level software becoming commoditized to a point where it's just become a utility. And I think the the growth of observability data is really kind of just the, the tail end of that of that growth. And now everyone expects there to be um, logs and metrics and charts and graphs and insights into all of this stuff. And I think that's just going to continue to grow. Um, probably not, you know, I, I think we had some of the initial, some of the respondents that, you know, thought that their organizations might see, you know, 5X growth or, or more. Um, but I, I think my guess is that a lot of those a lot of those companies are seeing that growth because they're um, in the middle of their, um, you know, kind of cloud migration journey or embracing tools like Kubernetes and they're starting to see that. But I think the, the industry as a whole, you know, I think we'll see pretty healthy year over year growth for quite a while. Um, yeah, and I think just going back to the things we said before, it's gonna come down to um, tooling choices to I think really get value as that stuff grows. Um, and yeah, I think there's, there's gonna be a lot of, uh, a lot of, cost explosions and a lot of pain for some of these teams that are managing these tools. But I think we're, I think we're in a place now where we're starting to see the rise of a, of a new set of tools that will, will make these challenges easier. Do we have more questions, Richard, or? Yep. We do. Thank you, Todd. The next question is, were there any surprise findings in this year's survey? I think this one could go to you, Stella. Um, yes, um, I spent last 10 years in, you know, monitoring observability, log management space. Um, some of the some of the responses are quite expected, such as you know troubleshooting times take longer or proliferation of tools. But some of the findings, such as if you don't scale with the your tool doesn't scale with the growth of data, um, that you will be exposing um, yourself to 
PII risks or accidentally exposing credentials um, and some of the kind of the, 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 the more urgent need we have in security space to, to take care, to take, uh, you know, harness all the data is very, very interesting um, to see, um, especially as the amount of data uh, volume grows that kind of um, keeping tabs on incidents and potential risk and security is becoming uh, more urgent than ever um, in this space. So that's something that was very surprising for me uh, because this survey specifically targeted IT organizations and those survey um, the security uh, realm is kind of shining through even for, for, for even though we didn't pull directly security professionals. So that's very, very interesting finding for me. All right, we have another question here. Does ERA software offer a self-managed deployment? Yeah, great question. And uh, we didn't we didn't talk too much about the specific product offerings, but yeah, I think um, our our ERA search product is is definitely deployable on prem um, or or in a you know a self managed cloud. Um, I think it's it's been it's something I think is somewhat unique to log management versus metrics and traces because I think to, to Stella's point uh, just a minute ago. Um, logs tend to have a lot of risk for having PII. And so I think for a lot of our customers, being able to take our product and run it in their own infrastructure, whether it's it's cloud or actually like physical hardware um, is a relatively big selling point. And I think there are a lot of um, other SaaS vendors that, you know, they're SaaS only. And so it becomes very difficult to actually have full control over that infrastructure. So um, I think given given the potential for, you know, security breaches and things like that. I think being able to go um, on-prem for, for log management is actually really important. I think it's going to be a, kind of a, a key part of our business going forward. Um, and I think it also just gives, it gives those customers the ability to um, run the software where they want and control how they manage costs and whether they want to, you know, move to a, you know, a different hosting provider or negotiate discounts on hardware. Um, you know, they're, they're free to do that. And the, you know, the, the price of the software can be a bit decoupled from the actual hardware that's being run on it. All right, thank you. And then this question can go to you as well, Todd. What are your expectations for streaming pipelines adoption? Yeah, awesome. Um, I, I get pretty excited about this because I, I see that we've had, um, you know, there, there are lots of logs coming from lots of different places. I think going to some of the, the charts we highlighted earlier, um, and I think you know we've seen a bit of um, my new favorite term, agent sprawl, uh, kind of in, in recent years. And it becomes very hard to get the the right logs from the right places in the right format. Deal with back pressure, deal with failures, and you know especially as we've got um, you know really infrastructure running all these different clouds, all these different places. You know downtime happens all the time, and so I think finding a way to remove the reliance on on agents to be responsible for, um, you know, really data data cleansing, data formatting, data transformation, um, and pushing that to, to a more centralized place. Um, you know, whether it's you know just uh, a very generic message queue, something like that, or a more um, you know a specific type of observability pipeline. I think we're going to see that that's going to become more common, and it's going to fit better with the the tooling and trends that I think modern de development teams are starting to embrace, whether it's, you know, GitOps style workflows, uh, being able to push configuration changes um, more, you know, more dynamically. Um, whereas I think rolling out configuration changes to thousands of agents across your entire infrastructure is actually pretty, pretty difficult to do, pretty difficult to coordinate. Um, and I think that that evolution of the observability pipelines and the broader kind of observability data management concept, I think we're going to see become something that more more organizations and more teams are going to become reliant on, and is actually going to start to be a, a pretty big part of how um, those orgs manage these huge data volumes across lots of different tools and have the have the confidence that things are working the way that they want, um, and that they can continue to make dynamic changes as you know as new products ship, as the company changes, as, as teams grow and as, as volume scale. Um, so yeah, I think we'll start to see, I think it's, it's still really early in that space. I think we'll start to see a lot more of that over the next uh, year or two, for sure. Um, we're coming to almost full hour. So if there are more questions, uh, please reach out to us directly. 
And uh, with that, I turn to Richard to say a few closing words. Yep, thank you. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, Stella. Thanks everyone for participating in today's session. Keep an eye on your email. We'll send you a recording of the webinar. If you have any questions or want a personal demo, you could reach out to us by visiting era.co co slash contact and filling out the quick form that's there. You can also sign up to try AirCloud completely free by going to era.co and clicking the free trial button in the upper right corner, and you'll get your first terabyte of log data for free. A big thank you from all of us here at ERA for being part of this webinar. We look forward to seeing you at our next event. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Thank, you. thank you. Thanks, everybody. All right. Let's, let's stop share.